also created a problem which didn't exist in the group selection paradigm. Well, what about the altruistic behavior? What about when the individual is self-sacrificing? On the group selection paradigm, well, that's no problem because it's advantageous to the species. On the individual selection paradigm, no, it, it created a very definite problem. The point is that a naive interpretation of Darwinism is that you would expect individual organisms simply to ensure their own survival and reproduction. The key to the problem of altruism was found by looking not at the individuals but at their genes and asking who they shared their genes with and what that meant for their behavior. Everybody in a sense knew that what animals work for is not their own survival but their own reproduction. Putting that in genetic terms what it means is survival of genes. Survival of genes means more than just individual reproduction because genes survive in other kin as well. This was the idea of the selfish gene. Individuals have an investment not just in their own children but their brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, cousins, anyone they share their genes with. It is the selfish genes that give us an evolutionary reason to care about our relatives. Evolutionary scientists had taken the first steps in solving the mystery of altruism. If they could do that, they began to wonder how much more of human behavior they could explain, and how much of a political storm their ideas would provoke. I could clearly see that the evolutionary logic led to some broad-scale implications for humans. And then I, I guess I felt like it would be nice if um, people didn't know for a few years that we were developing theory which applied to ourselves. But unfortunately, uh, my good friend Ed Wilson uh, let the cat out of the bag with his 1975 book on sociobiology. I was the fool that rushed in. I had a totally different perception, which was quickly corrected, of what the mood was among social theorists and social scientists and humanity scholars generally. All I did in that book uh, was to show some of the obvious implications of all the studies that we have been doing with animal social behavior for biology-based studies of human social behavior. He wanted to start a row with the sociologists and the psychologists who were his colleagues who really believed that the human mind was a kind of tabula rasa upon which experience could write what it liked. And Wilson quite rightly knew that was rubbish, that we're not a tabula rasa, we have all sorts of tendencies and, 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 and structures in our mind which can't just be twisted any old which way. And Wilson wanted to start an argument with them what he didn't know was that he was going to start a political argument. I don't think that Wilson had ever seen a real live Marxist in his life knowingly. And he suddenly found the whole of this sort of political crap sort of dropping on him. He didn't know it was going to happen. In sociobiology, Professor Wilson overturned half a century of separating human behavior and evolution. He declared in chapter one that the same evolutionary principles and instincts that guided animal behavior had to underlie our behavior, our thoughts, even our culture. The question was, how? The fundamental difference between an ant society and a human society is that the ants are programmed almost down to the last quiver of their antennae to be part of a colony, to be cogs of the wheel. This is radically different from the mammalian plan. Uh, there, it is the individual and the individual close kin that count, not the society to which they belong. When we were talking about eugenics, I, I blamed Hitler for, as it were, over-arousing people's consciousness. And I actually think that Hitler is to blame as well for the reaction that uh, came in 
when selfish genes and sociobiology were first being talked about. Because of Hitler and because of the social Darwinists, there was in the social sciences a kind of reflex horror of using the word gene in the same context, in the same sentence as humans, uh, human social behavior. And so people thought we were saying that genes control, that genes exert this kind of sinister robot-like control, that gene means something that uh, only fascists really talk about. And this was all a complete misunderstanding. When you talk about the natural selection of behavior, any animal's behavior, if you're going to do, if you're going to do Darwinism, you've got to talk about genes. Wilson had been careful to concede that unlike ants, we are not genetically determined and do have free will. But his critics still worried that behind his reasonable talk still lay a challenge to the idea that humans are ruled by culture, not by selfish genes. We today still have what I like to call the genetic leash on culture uh, that is absolutely unique to the human species. When, when we speak of the genetic leash, we can't have in our minds correctly a single leash between all the genes and all of culture. There's a different length and kind of genetic leash for every category or subcategory of behavior, and it varies enormously from one to the next. Let me give a, uh, several examples to make this point. The facial expressions extremely short leash, genetically determined, universal across all humans as to whether we show sadness, the way we do it, sadness, happiness, surprise, and so on. Um, we speak of language instinct, but what do we mean? We can see cultural evolution creating an immense array of variants among societies. Now we have an extremely long leash to understand the connection between biology and culture in each category of cognition and human social behavior is crucial in order to uh, really get a grasp of human nature and all of its consequences. Wilson had shown that it was not just the environment which shaped human behavior, but sociobiology had only solved the problem of cooperation between relatives. The next question was why do people cooperate with strangers? Could social cooperation be evolved? Or is it something that culture has to impose upon an essentially selfish nature? The answer came from studies of cooperation in the real world by political scientists using a theory called prisoner's dilemma. The Prisoner's Dilemma was a very good um, way of thinking about political problems and social problems where there's a tension between what's good for an individual and what's good for a group. The Prisoner's Dilemma is a puzzle. It imagines two partners in crime under investigation. Each faces a dilemma. If both keep quiet, they can both get off with a light sentence but each has the temptation to walk free if he blames the other. What should each one do? Cooperate or play safe and defect? This in its most elementary form is the tension between the collective good and individual self-interest. There obviously are strategies to achieve cooperation in the selfish world. The question is, what are they? But what was not understood is what is the best strategy to use. There are all sorts of possibilities that had been suggested about how one ought to play in a game like that, but there wasn't any consensus on what the best strategy was. So I wrote to people who had published suggestions about good strategies for the prisoner's dilemma and said, why don't you submit what you think would work best? And I got 14 entries from a variety of different fields, mathematics, philosophy, computer science, evolutionary biology, political science, economics, and so on. And when I ran them with each other, the one that did best was the simplest. 
of all the strategies submitted. It was tit for tat, which means cooperate on the first move and then do whatever the other player did on the previous move. The other player cooperated, you cooperate, the other player defected, you defect. Axelrod had discovered a startlingly effective strategy for creating cooperation. The revelation was it was so simple. If we could be instinctively selfish, then tit for tat showed that cooperation might just as easily be written into our genes. Well, it's Old Testament, you might say, an eye for an eye. And from that point of view, it's, you might say it's discouraging. Um, on the other hand, it is a way of sustaining cooperation among egoists, that even if everybody's out only for their own good, if they're in a prisoner's dilemma kind of situation, it is the way to encourage the other player to cooperate with you by making sure that uh, there are consequences if they don't. The discovery of tit-for-tat and...